So uh, Declan and I decided we'd try and do some sort of a double act here and talk about the comparisons between what's happening in Bristol as um, our UK case studies and what's happening in Australia and what we find out through research. Um, and I wonder, this slide first actually, so um, the report kind of breaks down into two parts and the first part is about how um, organisations form and the kind of stages in their development. We thought of this kind of as a chronology of development, starting from the inspiration of the initial idea, working your way through to formalising and expanding. Um, and you can sort of see through that that there starts to be a change from the, um, I don't know, the activism and idealism that initially fired the idea to maybe something that's a bit more legalistic and formal. Um, and we wondered how much that's really the case, whether it's actually a problem or not. So, starting with initial ideas and um, the inspiration. I guess they come primarily from maybe finding a social problem, um, seeing a business opportunity, trying to do things a little bit differently and trying to think of new, more socially equitable, fairer, greener ways of doing things. Um, and I don't know, Jeffrey, is that pretty much yeah, so sort of experience from Australia as well? Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the key <coughs> things that we found in Australia was a sort of spectrum of preparedness, I suppose, where um, you know some, some of these entrepreneurs would just see an opportunity and just absolutely pounce on it within a weekend, but then some people would spend literally years going through every possible avenue, thinking through every possible source of harm and taking out the right insurance and doing everything correctly. And we, and we sort of found everything in between that. And um, also, initial ideas, you know, are sort of also embedded in social context. It isn't just the lone, the lone entrepreneur. So um, these, these are very much embedded in, in uh, individual cities as well. There's you know big differences between Sydney and Melbourne, just as there are between you know, Bristol and, and London here. And there's a sort of focus on consumer-facing social enterprise more in Melbourne. Um, Sydney is our, is our finance capital, so that sort of brings its own personality to the to the projects. And um, Rachel Botsman, who is the um, author of, or one of the authors of the Collaborative Consumption book, lives in Sydney as well. So she's just sort of had quite an impact on. The, the social enterprise scene in, in Sydney. Um, and I think another question that we asked um, some of the organisations was whether they saw themselves as an enterprise or, a, um, if you like, an activist organisation. Although most of them said they were very much enterprises, in fact, when we talked to them, although they were <coughs> maybe campaigning as such, most of them were quite keen to do some sort of um, awareness raising or education or engaging with communities or showing that something is doable in a different way and maybe doing something that's replicable that other people can follow. Um, so once you've got an idea, you need somewhere to do it, um, which we've just called space. And that's not necessarily just a physical space, but maybe it's just space to think and experiment and um, get together with like-minded people to develop the idea. But you also need physical space as well, so perhaps a room, a field if you're trying to grow vegetables, um, a roof if you want to put solar panels up. Um, a workshop to repair bikes or work with wood, um, or a parking space if you're doing a car sharing enterprise. There are issues around finding parking spaces um, and whether your local authority might give you the parking space or whether you actually have to bid for it against maybe more commercial enterprises. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I suppose you know, we've, we've, we've found everywhere that local planning issues have their own you know, particularity that, that needs to be considered um, by all the entrepreneurs that we've interviewed. Um, and, uh, you know, really uh, accessing parking spaces um, has been a, a real issue for car sharing initiatives everywhere, everywhere we've looked and, you know, councils will bring their own sort of bureaucratic uh, reasoning and processes to that with varying levels of speed and, you know, receptiveness. And I've uh, been involved in a as a participant observer in a community energy project in Sydney as well, and finding a host site has, has proven to be um, enormously difficult and um, brings up you know, really interesting questions about uh, where the value of this lies because it it's, um, certainly hasn't been monetary in, in a direct sense for the, for the project I've been involved in. So it's <coughs> basically very much a, a social and economic process as well for that, for that side of the project. And yeah, we've also come up with issues with <coughs> short leases if you're sort of tenuously occupying council land. That's been a, a fairly um, ubiquitous thing in the project, but it's certainly been more pronounced with um, food issues we've seen here. Um, 
and actually that's been the case in the UK as well. Um, quite a few of the enterprises occupy land on very short leases at very low rents. Um, they possibly wouldn't be viable if they had higher, more commercial rents, but it does mean that their presence and existence on that land is fragile. Um, leases are likely to be renewed but not guaranteed, so that potentially is a problem too. <coughs> Um, and then there are the issues around forming an entity, um, and I've got a big why at the bottom of this slide. And the main reasons for forming an entity are um, formalising, making yourself legal, um, giving yourself legitimacy in the eyes of the wider public. Um, it might give you access to funding. It helps you to think about what you're trying to do and um, why you're doing it. Um, okay. I was going to say something. Yeah, I mean, in, in our in our working paper, we we describe it as um, sort of laser beams that you know sort of point off into the distance to say this is this is what's going to happen. This is you know where the money's going to flow. This is uh, who owns what and uh, how things can be traded as well. So you know, it's, it's an important part of the legal um, landscape of, of this space. Um, and there's you know different tax breaks for different types of enterprise. So on the two lists here at the top are the um, limited companies which don't necessarily state any sort of social purpose and um, they're a flexible form and the lawyers quite like them because they understand them, they're kind of standard forms if you like. And you can write into your articles if you do have a social purpose, there's no asset lock. Whereas the other forms, the CICs, um, community benefit societies, cooperatives and so on, actually very overtly state a social purpose. Um, which is beneficial if you're trying to look for funding that um, matches that. Yeah, so Brom and, and um, I have been involved with, in something called the Social Enterprise Legal Models Working Group, which has been working on this issue of coming up with a, um, with a form that has you know, particularly an asset lock in, in Australia because we don't have anything like a community interest company in there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose one of the general issues that we've seen across the UK and Australia is you know, the, the, the difficulty of finding the right legal advice and finding um, you know, the right fit between the social mission, which you know, Robin so richly described initially there, and you know, how do you actually translate that into a legal form? And you know, it's, um, it's, it's been, it's been a, 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 very, a really sort of rich area of the research. And then once you formalise, that gives you potentially access to all sorts of different routes of funding and you do need money to get going. Um, community shares in this country have become very popular in the last few years um, and there are different approaches to that. I think in community energy particularly, they've tended to go for larger shareholders but with better returns. In some other examples, um, the organisations have had maybe several hundred shareholders, each at £100 each, with potentially little expectation of either return or possibly even getting the money back, but a desire from the shareholders to see an enterprise actually start and get going. Um, the other, I suppose, main area of funds, in this country at least, is um, grants from various grant-giving organisations. And Grants, although they're great, are a bit risky because you can't guarantee that your enterprise is going to su survive on them forever. So in most cases, people saw grants as something that would fund additional things that were not core to the business. So it might buy you a new tractor when actually the old one was kind of okay, but you could do with a new one because it would be better and you'd help you to work better. Or it might help you to do some more community outreach or some additional work. Um, and being paid to employ, I suppose, is another strand of that too. Um, but most organisations were a little bit wary about signing up to schemes that paid them to employ people. The worry being that the people they got might not be bought into the ideas of the business and they might not be committed to working in the way that the enterprise actually wanted to work. Um, but on the other side of that, um, being paid to employ through, for example, rehabilitation schemes gives you um, maybe helps to meet your sort of social mission of rehabilitating people and helping them to work with their hands, for example, on the land or with wood. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I suppose this has been one of the really rich areas where we've been exploring this distinction between a gift and a contract, you know, sort of from, from the funder's perspective and from a donor's perspective, what are you, what are you expecting in, in return and you know, 
how can that be recognized and for, for this purpose and you know um, in the community energy space in Australia it's sort of we, you know people have ideas of you know, funding a particular solar panel you know people are likely to donate if, if you can have your name on the solar panel and go that one's mine there and um, you know, other people are going for much more um, general notions of, of the gift that, that isn't necessarily recognised. Um, and yeah, in the, in the sort of gritty detail of this, um, we've, we've had, we've, we've been involved in this crowdfunding um, uh, inquiry that's been ongoing, and I understand it's ongoing in the UK as well with the latest um, budget announcement saying they're going to look into it yet again. So it seems to be this perpetual area of government inquiry <coughs> they're going to do, but um, it's certainly been run away with by the by the, by the sort of tech sector in, in, in Australia, you know, the sort of startup um, in a very um, vanilla sense. <coughs> um, but uh, there's, you know, certainly been a lot happening with community shares here and also some interesting things with um, cooperative capital um, units using, uh, that have been used to fundraise uh, solar water initiative in Victoria. So that's been generating a lot of interest in Australia for social enterprises. And then there's expansion and red tape bit where um, organisations are increasingly feeling like they're professionalising and settling down into their skin and working out what they're really doing and how they're going about it. <coughs> and a few organisations um, talked about getting to that kind of five year point where you're starting to suffer from some growing pains and kind of need to revisit your governance and the things that you set up and the documents that you originally produced to see if that really fits your current purpose and where you're going. Um, Another aspect of this expansion and um, formalising is when you start to employ people and there's a whole extra area of law and the implications of law in how you employ people. And that kind of moves on from the volunteering bit where you might be having volunteers to help you do things and give them some sort of reward in return, so perhaps some vegetables or um, something to do with the business that you've got. And that's kind of a grey area because it's, does that impact on, for example, the benefit system and people receiving rewards for doing something? Yeah, so um, that, that last point there uh, is, is something we sort of picked up on from um, Janelle's work where she has this tremendous metaphor for the economy as it's been conceptualised over the 20th century. And you know, if, it's a, if it's a grain mill, we've just sort of added bolts onto this thing to tighten it up to, um, it's, a, it's sort of the, a really good metaphor for uh, the way regulation of standard employment has proceeded and um, sort of the question that, you know, once, once these get too tight you really can't make it work for these purposes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, in, in Australia, um, this, this hasn't been an issue for some of the more orthodox enterprises, particularly in the co-working space. And one of the um, one of the areas that I've been following quite closely, they've sort of self-consciously moved through different phases of, you know, initially just taking on enthusiastic, idealistic individuals, and then, you know, as they form small groups, then they sort of move on to the next phase of creative space for them. And then eventually, you know, the big end of town got wind of this and started to. Um, Send their employees to get a you know to get a bit of energy in, uh, in, into this and um, you know it's a, a, at each phase of, of its progress they, they sort of formalise the induction into the space and you know it would it, it sort of lost its um, it sort of lost some of its potentiality I think and, and became much more of a, an orthodox space so that was that was one of the most striking examples in the Australian context for me. <coughs> and actually in the, UK, in the UK context, under industry regulation, um, sometimes there's specific um, industry regulation that really applies to big business but equally applies to smaller businesses and involves them in a complexity of paperwork that for a small business is quite hard to manage and deal with and perhaps isn't quite appropriate for the way that they're operating or the direct relationship they have with their consumers or their employees. So it's kind of one size fits all which um, it's hard for small enterprises, particularly when they're starting up. Um, so the second half of this um, presentation, we're going to delve a bit more into the barriers and facilitators to different forms of social enterprise and the particular um, issues that they have. And it kind
kind of splits down into kind of three sections, something to do with their social interactions and how they work, um, and if you like the outward facing, how they deal with the public, uh, where they source support, um, and who the intermediaries are, and then a bit about the regulatory structures and the legal aspects of it. So thinking first about the social dimensions, there are various um, things to think about here in the way that um, enterprises work, how they work with each other, how they collaborate. Um, and competition for a lot of them is actually a healthy thing because if there are more people competing um, in their space and it, as a similar sort of organisation, well, actually that's good because it means the sector's growing. Um, which is very different from competition from more conventional incumbent businesses who are there to make profits where the enterprises we've spoken to want very clearly to distinguish themselves from those and say, you know, we have a social purpose, we don't make profits for ourselves, um, we work locally, we're locally owned. Um, and we asked people about conflict and how much conflict they had and how they dealt with it and where the problems were. And generally, a social enterprise says, well, we're here because um, we want to work with people, we have a social purpose, there's no conflict here, we all love each other. You know, that's part of the sort of ethos of drawing people together and being friendly. And if there is conflict, then they're very keen to get on it, deal with it, sort it out really quickly before it became a really big problem. And finally, the um, public understanding buy-in issue. And I've done a, I put a couple of pictures there, which is, you know, the supermarket rows of perfect vegetables, buy one, get one free, which is where most people source their vegetables from. That's against the locally grown... Um, locally managed veg box and the public ten or the majority of the public certainly in the eyes of some of the enterprises that we were dealing with um, seem to think that because they go to the supermarket and they've got all these bargains that they'll spend less money on their food and it's a good thing and why would we want to get a veg box and so surely that's some sort of fringe niche hippie thing um, so how to get the message across that actually there are different ways of sourcing what you're looking for and um, that actually is not necessarily more expensive it is a challenge, I think, for lots of different enterprises. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, I suppose there's, um, yeah, there's, there's sort of quite a lot to pick up on here from, from a comparative point of view, but just to, um, you know, just to take a couple of examples that um, from the collaborative and cooperative side, um, <coughs> one of the most interesting areas that we've, that, that, or, and one of the most striking areas I've found was sort of collaboration across different enterprises and across different sectors. So, you know, that was self-consciously built into some of the business models. So, you know, car sharing um, enterprises often found that, um, you know, their, their user base were also cyclists and uh, they would sort of hook in with um, bike shops and with, um, you know, local, local shops that they could uh, you know, use as, as sites for, um, you know, veg box uh, drop-offs and, and, and that sort of thing. So, looking for those sorts of um, affinities across different um, enterprises. Um, um, and then moving on to sources of support and intermediaries that help the enterprises that we've been talking to. Um, <coughs> thinking first about the professional networks, and obviously there are loads of networks. Um, you know, for example, in um, food growing, you might think about the National Farmers Union or the Tenant Farmers Association. And actually, most of the enterprises that we spoke to said that the bigger organisations, the more mainstream ones, were not terribly helpful in helping them to achieve what they wanted to do or networking with the people that were relevant to them. Um, and the more specific ones, for example, the Community Supported Agriculture Network, was much more useful in helping them to deliver their purpose. Or um, like the Furniture We Use Network or something like that. And some of them said that they'd actually made, um, established formal cooperative relationships. Um, so, for example, groups of farmers getting together to form a, a bigger cooperative, or solar installers getting together to form a bigger cooperative, which enables them to compete in a, in a wider market. Um, and the support organisations, there, there are two types of support organisations, if you like. There are the um, like the Cooperative Development Agency, Social Enterprise Works, those sorts of organisations that provide broader support in having an organisation set up, um, work out the sort of structure they need to take, um, what, what forms of governance are relevant, um, sources of funding and so on. And those organisations often refer people on 
on to specific professional um, like lawyers or accountants, for example, and actually the, the law, law firms we spoke to said that that was really useful as a conduit, so the pro bono support they were giving was to enterprises that were actually, if you like, deserving of it, that did have a proper social purpose that helped fit with their um, pro bono ideas. I'll do let Philip in a minute. Yeah, and I, I suppose this is one of the areas where technology matters in a lot of ways, where, you know, I mean, we, we can sort of group lobbying in, um, in this as well to some degree, where particularly in, in the energy space, there's, a, there's been a real push to pull expertise just because rules around grid connection and around tax incentives are so technical that you know, it's much more advantageous if you have a few people working, combing through the details. And we were just at an event this week where this was made very explicit, where they, they basically said, um, you know, if we, if we have the right um, people supported, we can, you know, look for uh, led, we, we basically uh, point to bad drafting of legislation and push, and push back against it by employing the right uh, lawyers and accountants to, to to pick it apart, and then you know we can we can sort of lobby on on that basis. So um, yeah, there's a sort of ad hoc um, you know support that, that develops when the political need arises as well, and that's and that's particularly pronounced in you know this highly specialised. Yeah, I mean, the lobbying thing is definitely the case in this country where um, a network of um, individual organisations carries much more weight in lobbying the government if um, you can show you're representing um, a mass of other organisations. Um, and the final point on this slide, the local authority issue, is an interesting one. Um, in Bristol, the local authority, in theory at least, is very um, in favour of social enterprise and the mayor is very much in favour of it. But the reality is that there's very little actual support, there's very little money in local government to provide positive support. And actually within the local authority in Bristol, um, a number of the enterprises we spoke to said that some parts of the authority were great, they were really supportive, really helpful, really positive. And then another bit, a different department was in opposition against what they were doing, or you know, the best indifferent. So there's an issue of maybe communication across the authority and um, you know, maybe some sort of underlying ethos that isn't quite there. I don't know if that's also the case in Australia. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's most pronounced in um, in the, the the transport space, where you know you, you have road engineers that are of, often come from the, the very fringes of the city and have a very particular mindset to maximise traffic flow, and you know, any anything to do with car sharing or cycling is seen as an impediment to maximising the you know throughput of cars, so um, there's, yeah, there's a sort of funny cultural sort of quirk there that, that plays out through local councils um, that, yeah, that's, that, that also plays out in, in the energy space as well to some degree. Um, and finally something about policy and regulation and how that is a facilitator or a barrier to social enterprises. And the first point here is about accessing legal support and the difficulty in accessing legal support. A few of our interviewees said that um, they kind of knew that they would, they could do with some legal support, but they weren't quite sure how to go about it, or that it was really expensive, and that they were a bit nervous about talking to lawyers. Um, so I think that's sort of an issue because there's a perception that lawyers have a, if you like, a more kind of conventional, um, mainstream mindset, and they don't really understand what's going on in the social enterprise world and how to access and find the people that are is, is certainly a bit of an issue. Um, and then a few of our interviewees said that actually, um, in terms of government policy and the legal structures that they work within, some of the recent government policy, which um, I suppose is kind of right-wing, has supported what might arguably be described as left-wing activity, for example, in um, deregulating energy supply and is setting up a, a CIC form, which is a very flexible fleet of foot sort of form to enable enterprises to form while still stating their, their social purpose. Um, and actually in the energy arena, the feed-in tariffs, which effectively provide guarantee, government guarantees to investors. Um, but also there are issues around um, perhaps government struggling to keep up with what's really happening out there and the sort of the massive changes that are happening in the um, initiatives and entrepreneurs that are getting out there and trying to do different things. The government is still kind of bogged down in a slightly more traditional way of doing things and hasn't really caught up with it. 
And um, comments were made by several of the interviewees that there's a the relative lobbying weight of big business is working against them. You know, even <coughs> when they get together to form networks to try and do their own lobbying, big business still has a huge weight of, um, if you like, finance and stuff behind them, which enables them to carry more weight with government. And um, we've perhaps seen this in reduction of eco targets for big energy companies, or in the lack of regulation for repairability and reuse of goods or in the relative lack of support for organic and small-scale community-supported farming. And again, actually, in central government, there's a perception of lack of connectedness across different government departments. Yeah, and, and, I, and I suppose this is sort of one of the areas where, Janelle work, where, where Janelle's work has been quite inspiring because, you know, it's been about explicitly trying to change that mindset about, um, you know, who, who has access to legal support and how they think about the law as well. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hear more on that front later. Finally, um, we asked all the interviewees what sort of animal they were, and um, the idea of this question was really to encourage them to think about the relationships between themselves, the competitors, um, where they sort of sat within the, the environment, and. Um, they came up with all sorts of animals, as you can see, a whole spectrum of animals. Um, but generally, the sort of underlying explanation, if you like, when they started to drill down why they'd chosen an animal, most of them came up with an animal really quickly and then thought, well, actually, maybe we're not quite one of those, but something a little bit different. Um, but generally, they're kind of social and friendly and clever and keen to please, but also, you know, persistent and adaptable and um, keen to stay there and to make a difference and to do something. Yeah, and we, we, we actually had two tigers, one of them was in the energy space and one of them was a legal practice, so that's, that's why the tigers were here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there, there, there is a kind of serious point underlying this, which is, um, you know, that there's this uh, sort of connection between uh, the, our, our metaphors and the economy that's, that have been traced by people like Philip Morosky, where, you know, concepts of growth um, were sort of taken from physics in the, in the 19th century. So. I think that you know, these, these sort of labels have formative consequences. And, um, yeah. Did somebody send them a dodo? Or George Harris? It's a dodo. Yes, yeah, the, the, the dodo was someone in, in recycling because they wanted to become extinct. <laughs> so, so, they, so they wanted to make themselves redundant, actually. So. Yeah, so that's kind of a quick run through the sorts of things we found in um, talking to the various enterprises in the two countries. So I guess we just want to thank all the people who we've interviewed for their time, and some of them are here today as well. And as Bromma said at the beginning, to the two universities, and that's the website. And the results from this workshop will be on the website sometime in the next couple of weeks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.